So I would like to welcome all of you again to the symposium and to this rather uh, special panel tonight. As you remember, or some of you may remember yesterday, I mentioned that I believe that now, 50 years later, it is time to try again. And tonight, we'll hear from our panelists um, why they think it may be time to try again to understand the brain and to engineer the mind. Um, I know that they will speak about several different powerful reasons of why it, it is time to try again. Some of the obvious arguments range from the computer power that we is available today to the progress in neuroscience and in biology, the fact that the problem is too important, um, and so on. Um, they may also speak why we have to be cautious, because of course the problem of intelligence has been around for a few thousand years, and uh, uh, it would be unwise to think we can solve it um, in a decade or so. But before introducing my panelists, I want to tell you my personal reasons for why I think it is time to try again. Um, and my argument tonight is not so much about the scientific reasons, they will take care of this, um, but about the um, question of whether we can convince enough good people to try again. If we can, I'm sure that interesting things will happen. Can we trigger a lot of enthusiasm? You know, bouts of irrational exuberance are probably key to the evolutionary success of Homo sapiens. I think we can, and why? Because um, my argument is that the time has come for a new generation to get the flu. <laughs> what I mean is the following. Uh, epidemics of the same flu virus recur um, with a periodicity of about 25 years or so, for obvious reasons. Uh, a generation gets infected, and then it is immune. Um, Powerful ideas are also infective. And the AI epidemic started around 1960. I got infected, in fact, in the late 60s, 70, when I came to Cambridge to see Marvin Minsky, met instead David Marr, and moved to MIT. And then the infective meme came back again um, around 85 under the name of neural networks and machine learning. I was immune at the time, of course, and so I was quite critical of neural networks, probably wrongly in a sense. But I bet that now the epidemic is about to recur again 25 years later. And so this is why I think this symposium may indeed be a timely idea why I hope it will be highly effective. Now, um, um, let me set up the rules of the game. I will introduce all of our speakers right now, um, briefly, because I think I don't want to take out time uh, for, from the two hours that we have. Um, I'll give them 10 minutes, and then um, I will start to become very agitated <laughs> when the 10 minutes expire. <laughs> um, I want to remind people here that there is a reception at 7.30. Um, this is uh, um, a great gift from the McGovern um, Institute. It will be in the McGovern Institute. You are all invited. Um, and, and let me start with uh, a brief introduction to our speakers. So first, Susan Hockfield. She um, was the William Edward Gilbert Professor of Neurobiology at Yale University be before becoming Professor of Neuroscience in our own Department of Brain and Cognitive Science. She joined the Yale faculty in 85, was named full professor in 94. She pioneered the use of monoclonal antibody technology in brain research, leading to her discovery of a protein that regulates changes in neural structure as a result of an animal's experience in early life. And by the way, she's also president of MIT. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Hawkins. Uh, Jeff earned his uh, um, Bachelor of Degree in Electrical Engineering from Cornell. He was elected to the National Academy of Engineering. He authored the book On Intelligence, 
Uh, so very much appropriate to have you here, Jeff. And uh, in uh, um, 2002, created Redwood Neuroscience Institute, which studies theories of neocortex. It's at Berkeley now. And in 2005, he co-founded Numenta, which is creating a technology based on neocortical theory. He belongs to the mythology of Silicon Valley with Donna Dubinsky, the founder of two mobile computing companies, Palm and Handspring. Bob De Simone. Uh, Bob is director of the McGovern Institute. He is a professor in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Science. Before coming here six years ago already, he was director of uh, the Intramural Research Program at NIH. Uh, he's a member of all the academies, a recipient of numerous awards. He's my most direct boss and a wonderful collaborator. And Phil, Phil Sharp is institute professor at MIT. He's a member of the new David Koch Institute uh, for Cancer Research. Um, he joined uh, MIT in 74, served as the director of the cancer for, uh, Center for Cancer Research, and then was head of the Department of Biology, and then uh, director of McGovern Institute. Um, he has, done so many things. He's probably the most decorated and honored member of the MIT faculty. He's also a co-founder of Biogen and Alnilam Pharmaceuticals. Um, I helped him start the McGovern Institute together, and that was an experience I'll never forget. <laughs> um, Christoph. So Christoph um, was born in uh, Kansas City, I guess. Grew up in Holland, Germany, Canada, and Morocco. He studied physics in uh, the University of Tübingen. He's uh, a professor at Caltech since 86. He's the author of several books, uh, uh, some on biophysics, one on the quest for consciousness. He worked with Francis Crick for many years on consciousness, and he will take part in a panel tomorrow on consciousness. He's currently on leave from Caltech uh, as the chief scientific officer of the Allen Institute for Brain Science in Seattle. He was my first graduate student, and I'm very proud of him. <laughs> Peter, Peter Norvig um, is uh, a fellow of the uh, American Association for Artificial Intelligence. He is director of research since uh, 2005 at Google. Um, he was before at NASA, professor at USC, at Berkeley. Um, one of his book, books, Artificial Intelligence, A Modern Approach, is the most popular textbook in artificial intelligence. It's great. You are here, Peter. And uh, uh, um, Shimon. Shimon Ullman is, um, well, is back to MIT. Um, he got his PhD in 77 from the Department of Computer Science at MIT. He was David Marr, first PhD student. Um, in 94, he left to join the Department of Applied Math and Computer Science at the Weizmann Institute, um, where he's a professor now. Last year, he was the recipient of a Rummelhart Prize, and part of the motivation says that it is for the, his outstanding contribution that are highly influential in shaping the research direction of a whole generation of cognitive scientists and neuroscientists. Shimon is back part-time to MIT for the fall semester, I hope for many years to come. Um, and finally, Josh is co-moderating with me this, uh, this panel, in fact, you'll take uh, charge of running the discussion. Um, he's the Paul Newton professor uh, in our department. Josh is, is uh, really bringing theory and math to cognitive science. Um, it's uh, a glue that is uh, representing a glue that uh, puts various parts of our department in the broad area of neuroscience really together. And uh, um, he has been uh, very instrumental in starting this intelligence initiative and in uh, the idea of this symposium. Um, 
So with that, I'll call Susan to the podium. 10 minutes. <laughs> I want to thank Tommy for that uh, great introduction and thank uh, Tommy and Josh and Irene for, um, let me just say, the audacity of inviting me to participate in the content part of a symposium. Um, <laughs> it's new. Uh, we're in the midst of our, we're not in the midst of, we're at a day, I think 118 of our 150 days of celebrating MIT's 150th anniversary, but who's counting? Huh? I am. Uh, I haven't introduced every single event, but I've introduced a lot of events. But as I said, most people are pretty careful to keep me away from the content. Um, so this is um, uh, a, a treat for me to be here. Um, you know, the, the events for the 150th have been absolutely fascinating. I've told many of you that they certainly have been far more amazing and wonderful substantive than I ever imagined when we decided to go forward with it. But, you know, they've been serious, they've been whimsical, they've been expository, they've been beautiful, they've been historical, and they have been provocative. And I kind of hope this symposium ends up to be in that last category of provocative. MIT was founded with the ambition of making science more useful and the useful arts, uh, basically engineering and technology, more scientific. It was founded at a time when America was beginning to industrialize, industrialize and our founder, William Barton Roger, was really at his wit's end that the nation didn't have a way of educating people to work with both their hands and their minds. And on that basis, MIT was, was founded. And um, that brings us to our motto, uh, mind and hand, which also laid the foundation for the kind of cross-disciplinary work we are able to do at MIT. Um, and this symposium is, of course, consonant with those kinds of ideals. Um, I want to just say a few things. And you know, they invited me to participate in content, but I don't have any content to contribute because um, what Tommy described about my life as a neuroscientist, I left that behind me when I came to MIT six and a half years ago, thinking that there were very few coals I could bring to Newcastle that would burn as well as the coals that were already here or would be joining uh, the enterprise. Um, I love the premise of the symposium that now is the time. And as a, um, a neuroscientist, my view is now is always the time for a new push to drive neuroscience more closely toward an understanding of intelligence. Uh, but I also uh, will not astonish any of you by telling you that I believe that MIT is really the place or one of the places where we can make real inroads into some of these problems, prob mostly because of our incredible foundation in interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary work. Uh, when I first arrived at MIT, I was surprised, I was struck by the amount of cross-disciplinary work that was going on. The then dean of the School of Engineering, Tom Magnetti, told me that fully a third of the faculty at that time were engaged in some way in the life sciences. Uh, my guess is it's far more than a third uh, today. And um, the message that I receive from many, and that we can see in many things that are going on at MIT, is that um, there is incredible amount of cross-disciplinary work, particularly in bringing the life sciences into the great conversation between the physical sciences and engineering that led to the dramatic changes in human life that we know today. Um, so the idea of the convergence is a message that is being carried around the nation by people from MIT. Phil Sharp has been a great uh, leader in the discussion of this topic, as have uh, Tyler Jacks and um, Bob Langer. Another way of thinking about where we are today from the perspective of the life sciences is that this is a third revolution. The first revolution in the life sciences was molecular genetics that began with the elucidation of the structure of DNA by Jim Watson and Francis Crick in the early 1950s. Um, while uh, I was at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory from 1980 to 1985 as one of two neurobiologists, and uh, some of my colleagues who were really great molecular biologists would often remind us that there was very little biology in neurobiology. Uh, meaning that molecular genetics had not quite penetrated. Indeed, the first brain gene was cloned in um, 19, um, around 1980 by Steve Hyman and, and his group. So molecular genetics finally caught on in the brain. Um, the second uh, revolution was genomics, so the massive power of computing that allows us to understand gene sequences and the importance of those sequences for various disease processes or various um, uh, normal processes at an incredible 
uh, level of complexity and an incredible level of resol resolution. And the um, insight that I would just call out today, I could call out many, is the identification of candidate regions for autism. I have to tell you, as a neuroscientist 10 years ago, I would never have imagined that at this time in the universe, uh, we would have the kinds of opportunities and the kind of insights into these incredibly complex diseases that we have today. It's an exciting time for neuroscience. And the third revolution, this one we call the convergence, is adding engineering and the physical sciences into the mix. And there are so many examples of this, um, I need hardly um, uh, enumerate them for you. Uh, we believe in this convergence at MIT. We believe in it uh, so fervently that uh, several weeks ago we dedicated the David H. Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. We've been doing cancer research at MIT since the mid-1970s in the Center for Cancer Research. Um, our new, our third revolution in, bio, in the life sciences as applied to cancer is a building, a, gigantic, a very large building, uh, that accommodates about 25 labs. About half of them are the labs of cancer biologists, and the other half are the labs of engineers who want to bring their engineering thought processes and know-how into this mix of cancer. We also have uh, clinicians in that mix. But um, we believe, that I believe, and clearly my colleagues who are a part of the Intelligence Initiative believe that this convergence will also bring new insights around intelligence. If you think about the things we can do today that we couldn't do just a short uh, number of, a small number of years ago, uh, the uh, increases in our ability to use imaging technology is simply fantastic. Uh, looking at brain regions in action, which is work that is done by many people at MIT, but I would call it that of Rebecca Sachs. Um, the our ability to monitor states of consciousness, whatever that might be, and my colleagues tonight might tell us something about consciousness uh, that people like Emory Brown are engaged in. Uh, the whole world of optogenetics, which has become a new tool, much like electrophysiology used to do, used to be, uh, by Guoping Fang and Ed Boynton and many of their colleagues, and you know, incredible new tools. Uh, Fatih Yannick in the Department of Electrical, Electrical Engineering, Computer Science, is designing the most amazing high-throughput screening methods that allows you to look at things that are going on in the brain. So, uh, and what we'll hear a lot about tonight are the new powers or the dancing and increasing the power of computation to bring insight. So um, let me just spend a second or two talking about intelligence, uh, which again, it's something that I watch with awe from my office here because there's lots of intelligence walking by the office uh, all the time. <laughs> One of the things I love about MIT is I could walk out of my office at any moment of any day and stop anyone in the corridor and ask her or him what they're working on, and they will tell me something that makes my jaw drop because it's so astonishing. It's a place that's full of intelligence. But um, I have to confess, since being among friends, uh, when I was at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, I was looking for the magazine in which this was published. I was interviewed in an article about Jim Watson, about why the lab was interested in neuroscience. And um, being a somewhat um, brassy, um, uninhibited young scientist, um, I offered uh, my belief that through the invasion of molecular biology into neuroscience, uh, we would come up with the next chapter in psychology and the next chapter in philosophy. Um, I feel like now really is the time we're going to be able to make those connections in ways that are um, different and more informative than ever before. So I still hold out hope that maybe um, in less than a decade, we'll see new ways of thinking, we'll understand new ways of thinking about psychology and behavior, about linguistics, about philosophy. Um, and what's delightful for me to watch is the places where people are coming from to participate in the intelligence initiative. Uh, Tom Malone from the Sloan School, I saw Andrew Lowe here earlier from um, Sloan, was a great economist. Uh, the former head of the economics department uh, said to me once, he said, you know, pretty soon we'll all be neuroscientists. <laughs> that would be a good thing. Um, so I have to end with a note of caution, which is, um, you know, we're, because I only have two minutes or less, I guess Tommy's being nice to me, um, are we going to come up with uh, new answers? Um, and I said, of course we'll come up with new answers, but probably not definitive ones for a while. But I have to tell you that I really do believe that this approach of costing disciplines, of bringing people together in great conversations like the one that is being held in the symposium on the one tonight, is really the way that we can advance the field. 
Um, I do think that um, symposia like this are the crucibles in which new ideas are forged together to bring together testable new insights. And so I thank all of you for being here. I thank my colleagues for participating. And um, in the spirit of mind in hand, uh, I hope that out of this symposium will come new hopes, uh, new ideas for frontier advancing actionable ideas. Thanks for being here. Jeff Falkins. Well, I get to follow Sue Hockfield. That is cool. So uh, this is the question that we were asked to address. Uh, is it time to try again to understand the brain and engineer the mind? Uh, I have been uh, trying to do this for the past 30 years on sometimes part-time, sometimes full-time, for the last 10 years full-time. So I don't think you'd be surprised if, uh, if I answer this question with a yes. Um, <laughs> because I've been trying to do this. But uh, I'd like to give you my philosophy about it, uh, give me some of my opinions about it, and sort of pull in some color around that question. Um, and, uh, and hopefully that'll be a, an interesting discussion point in contrast to some of the other panelists. The first question is, why should we try? Uh, it may seem obvious to you, but it's worth stating again and again. I think there's two reasons we should try to understand the brain. One is it's just the most interesting thing I can think about working on. We are, we are a species defined by our brains, and everything we've ever done is a product of our brains. So, it, you know, knowledge and questions are products of brains, and so uh, it's just the most interesting thing to do. The other thing is, I believe we can build very intelligent machines. Um, we can discuss what that will, they will look like, but, and I think these will be extremely important for uh, our security, our future, for discovering and exploring the world, and perhaps ultimately our survival as a species. So I think it has a very practical and important aspects to it as well. So my answer to that one is it's the most important quest for humanity. That's how I feel about it. I can't imagine why everyone doesn't want to work on this. <laughs> why now? Um, did something happen to the 149th anniversary of MIT and the 150th anniversary of MIT? I'm going to flip this question around and say it the other way. Let's say, is there some reason why we can't do it now? There was a good argument a number of years ago that our computers weren't big enough and fast enough. That argument is not true anymore. There's arguments that perhaps we're going to discover some amazing new discoveries in neuroscience. It'll just like the Rosetta Stone, just open it up. That may happen. Uh, I don't know if that'll happen. But I do know this. We have collected and continue to collect huge volumes of neuroscientific data that have not been assimilated into a theoretical framework today. There's a ton of stuff that we just don't understand why it's like that. And so there's no point in waiting. And I actually believe uh, pretty strongly that we have what we need to succeed today. What we're lacking is an initiative and ideas, not lacking some magic formulas, new mathematicians, or whatever. It's, it's, we just need to get serious about this and take the right approach. Next question is, what is the goal? What, is, what do we want to achieve? What is it going to look like? And here, you'll find there's lack of un, uh, unanimity here. People have very different opinions. I'm going to state mine. I think there's two components of what we need to find here. The first component is we need a detailed brain theory. This is the theory that is in the language of neuroscience. It explains why neurons look the way they do, why they behave the way they do, how they work together in ensembles, what the brain structures are about. It is a detailed theory that is both mathematical and information that relates in the language of neuroscience and can be tested in neuroscience. That is not the only thing we need, though. I believe we have to do something else. We have to build machines that work on these principles. Carver Mead said, you don't understand something until you build it, and he's right. And we have to do this. So we want to merge these two things. It's the computer science and the, engineer and the neuroscience together. Now, I'm now going to give you an example of how I think we should go about this, the kind of things that I do. Um, and I'm not speaking for other people here. But I'm going to point out three essential neuroscience discoveries that, really inf that sort of tell you a hell of a lot about building intelligent machines. The first one is the issue of representation. A senior AI person once told me, the only thing that matters in artificial intelligence is the issue of representation. How do you represent information? We know in brains and computers are quite different. In a computer, we use typically what's called a dense representation. You might think of a byte like an ASCII code. We take all combinations of the zeros and ones, 256, we assign the meaning. Now, one thing we can say is that the, the bits don't mean anything. They have no semantic meaning. If I ask you, what does the third bit in an ASCII code mean, it means nothing. It's an arbitrary assignment. When we look at brains, we see representations are very different. They're sparse distributed representations. You might see 1,000 or 10,000 cells are representing something, of which only a small percentage, 2 or 3 or 4 percent, are active at any point in time. 
We can represent that by a whole bunch of zeros, like a whole bunch of bits, like 10,000 bits, of which most are zeros and a few are ones. And what we find in brains is that the actual bits or the cells actually have semantic meaning. It's not something that's pre-assigned, pre uh, pre it's learned. But we can say, what is the cell kind of representing at this point in time? It doesn't flop microsecond to microsecond. It means something else. And so this is a way of representing information in the brain. There's some really interesting properties about sparse distributed representations. Um, they, since they encode semantic meaning, you can do semantic comparisons. I can take two representations and say, how are they similar? How are they different in multiple facets and ways? I can do, I can do generalization on semantic meaning. And there's some very cool and unexpected properties of these like mathematical properties, which I don't have the time to tell you about. But I'll tell you this. This is the language of brains. And I'm going to argue that if you're going to build a, a, an intelligent machine, and if you're going to have a brain theory, you, it's going to be built on sparse distributed representations. That doesn't mean you can't use a traditional computer to emulate that. You can. But you have to speak in the language of brains, and that's the language. The second one is neurons. Brains are made of neurons, obviously. How they work together is obviously going to be very important how brains work. This is a picture of a, of a classic cortical cell, a pyramidal cell. It has a cell body and a bunch of dendrites and synapses and so on. People realize that if you're going to understand brains, you have to understand how neurons work together. It's pretty simple. Going back 80, 70 years to McCulloch and Pitts, people have been building models in neural networks. Most of those models, not all of them, but most, and still most today, use very simple neural model, something sometimes called a point neuron model which essentially you have a cell, you have some inputs, and there's some synapses. And you train this, or you learn by changing the weights of these synapses or the strength of them. And they ignore the dendrites. We now know that, we know that neurons are very, very different than this. Uh, and some of this is recent knowledge. We know that they have thousands of synapses. We now know that learning occurs mostly in the formation of synapses, not in the change of strengths. We know that synapses can form and unform very rapidly. We also know that dendrites, the branchy parts of the neurons, are very complex processing elements. This is where actually the processing occurs in the, in the neuron. And the latest, this is all in the last 10, 15 years that this has really become out. We now know that dendrites act as sort of nonlinear threshold detectors. And, and so if you're going to build a model of a brain, you have to understand the computational properties of neurons as we know them today, not as we knew them 50 or 60 years ago. In the work I do, this is a picture of the kind of neurons that we model. And I can't walk you through this, but there's a cell body. That's, the colored dots are the synapses. They're arranged on proximal distal dendrites, et cetera. It turns out that these kind of neurons are actually very, very good for processing sparse distributed representations. The third thing I'm going to talk about is hierarchy. The brain, and we've known this back since uh, 100 years ago. Cajal wrote eloquently about this in the histology of the nervous system, that brains evolved hierarchically. You, you know, when you start with something like a, a spinal cord, you end a brain stem on top of it, then later there's a basal ganglion, the cerebellum, and the hippocampus, and the neocortex, et cetera. You're kind of layering on complexity. That's how they evolve, and that's how they structure. The neocortex itself is divided into regions, and those regions in the neocortex are hierarchically organized. And so you have hierarchies on top of hierarchies. This picture in the upper right, which represents part of the macaque monkey's brain, is actually a picture of a data structure that the brain uses. As an engineer, I look at that and say, that's the data structure. Those are sparse distributed representations in a hierarchy. You can't ignore this. And I argue if you're going to build truly intelligent machines, you have to incorporate these ideas. You have to incorporate, um, uh, well, here I'm going to say, uh, sorry, but you know, we understand a little bit of how hierarchies work. They're, they're about for efficiency and, and generalization. But the point is, if you're going to actually build machines this way, you're going to have to understand these concepts and incorporate them. So these three essential discoveries, I argue, a little bit, somehow this slide got a little messed up on the map. Um, are, are actually things, the kind of things we have to look at and, and take seriously. You know, we can't ignore this. Uh, and, and our theories and our, and our models have to take that in advantage. Now, the next question I wanted to uh, answer here is, is, how can we accelerate progress? I have three suggestions. The first suggestion is that neuroscientists need to embrace theory. Some do, many don't. In fact, it was until very recently the NIH used to discourage neuroscientists from including a theoretical component to their to their, uh, their grant requests. It was like, don't do that. That's speculative. Right? When we make this the process, we need to say, you, if you're going to be doing neuroscience, you have to have a theoretical framework from which to understand it. The second thing we need to do is that machine learning theorists need to embrace biology. It is astonishing how little biology most machine learning people know. It is amazing. Not all, but many. And this is unacceptable. If you really think you're building machines that work like the brain, operate the brain, I believe you have to know this stuff. And the final thing you can do is you can accelerate progress with commercial success. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, you laugh. It's a really powerful motivator. What you can do, you know, if we can take these principles 
and build something very commercially valuable on that people will say, hey, that's important. I'm going to study that. And that's what I'm trying to do. I have one last slide. I have a company called Nementa. And what we've been doing at Nementa for a number of years is we've been trying to understand how ensembles of neurons form sparse distributed representations, learn sequences of sparse distributed representations, make predictions of those, and it can do this in a hierarchy. We had a real breakthrough about 18 months ago where we figured out how these kind of more realistic neurons can work in layers and columns, the kind of structures you see in the neocortex. And these kind of models can be, are very powerful learning tools. You can pass in uh, massive parallel data streams and it can discover the spatial stru uh, temporal structure in them. We're trying to turn this into a business. Uh, we're going to try to build a product on this for automatic pattern discovery and large data. But part of my goal is to motivate people and get people interested in this. In fact, these algorithms, you can read all about them if you want. There's a white paper on our website that tells you exactly how they work. So that's it. I think I've stuck posting to my 10 minutes yep. right there. <laughs> Thank you. Bob De Simone. So in the last 24 hours, we've heard how advances in computation, uh, cognitive science, uh, linguistics, social science, even economics, are inspiring new intelligent systems or are about to inspire. And I'm here to make the case that there'll be advances in neuroscience that will become one of the major drivers of this field as well. Now, of course, there's already been substantial advances in neuroscience in the last decades. Uh, that, and these advances are already beginning to inspire uh, intelligent systems, and we just heard from Jeff Hawkins how he's taken some of the principles that have come out of neuroscience work and have already uh, been incorporating them into useful systems. Uh, another uh, good uh, example I'd like to uh, raise is the example from visual object recognition. The AI approach to visual object recognition actually was basically started here at MIT by David Marr and some of the speakers at the colloquium, Tommy, uh, Shimon, uh, and others. Uh, and, uh, and it was thought initially that this would be a pretty straightforward problem because people do object recognition effortlessly. Uh, but the problem is it turned out to be an incredibly difficult problem, particularly how people recognize uh, objects at different size and scales and positions and orientation and illumination and so on. And it, it was very, very difficult to design artificial systems to do what people did so easily. But based on what was been discovered about the biological uh, visual system, uh, Tommy Poggio and his colleagues have begun to design uh, recognition systems that incorporate these principles into the artificial uh, systems that emulate the operations of the biological systems at each level. Whoops. Uh, at, at, incorporate at, at each level with the uh, increase in receptive field size at each level, the increase in complexity, and so on. And based on these neurally inspired models, uh, the um, these, uh, neural, uh, these uh, recognition systems are now doing about as well with single objects on relatively simple backgrounds, about as well as people can do in recognizing objects, at least with briefly presented images. And now this work is now moving into the next stage, which is uh, recognizing objects in complex scenes and in clutter, a very much more difficult problem. But uh, people like Tommy and Christoph Koch and myself are trying to reverse engineer the biological attention system and trying to understand how attention can provide a solution to this problem of, of recognition and clutter. But although these are significant advances, you know, if you think about what our visual systems are capable of, uh, it's, they're capable of much more. We, we extract real meaning from scenes. And this, is, of course, is the basis of art and culture even. And, and how uh, we carry out those really in, most intelligent of operations in the world is something that we don't have any understanding of as yet in, in neuroscience. And this is going to require a real leap in our understanding of how the brain computes to understand, to take this to another level. And we can run the video. And that means going beneath the surface, and I would argue to, uh, to gain a deep understanding of the basic computation unit of the brain, which is the neural circuit. In any important decision, the brain is utilizing millions of neurons, hundreds of millions of connections. And that needs to be understood. The basic principles of operations need to be understood better than they are today, uh, I think, believe, in order to make real advances uh, in this field. And um, 
I know that Jeff is a, a maybe a, a glass half full uh, sort of person. He's very enthusiastic about the principles that have been discovered. But I really think that there are some fundamental principles that we still do not understand. But I believe that the tools for understanding circuits and, and extracting those principles actually are in our hands or have, and have recently come into our hands. And those include tools for tracing uh, anatomical connections, the wiring diagram of the brain, for recording activity across these populations, which would be the functional uh, diagram of the circuits, and then testing hypotheses about how these circuits work uh, using uh, new tools for optogenetic manipulation of neural activity. I'm going to give you some examples of these approaches and where they're going to lead us. Based on advances in genetics and molecular bi biology, we're now able to label all the different cell types, all the different connectivity, as you see in this uh, beautiful example from the fish a visual system. Uh, here's an example from the mouse, mouse brain from the work of, of uh, Josh Sains and Jess, Jeff Lickman based on their brainbow technique. Again, an incredible detail on how neurons uh, wire up uh, with each other. And here at MIT, I can have that run that video, uh, Sebastian Sung and his colleagues uh, are taking this even to another level, uh, reconstructing neural circuits from serial electron micrographs uh, in which you can uh, reconstruct the neurons and all of their synaptic connections with all the other neurons uh, in a circuit. It's really phenomenal information about how these circuits uh, wire up. Now, of course, in human beings, uh, we're, uh, it's not yet feasible to do, go to this scale of connectivity, although that, that could well change in the next few years. Uh, but we are gaining uh, information at least about the coarse connectivity of the human brain using new techniques based on MR imaging known as diffusion tensor imaging and work from the labs of John Cabrielli and Nancy Kamwisher, for example, here at MIT, are using this to look at the connectivity of many of the different functional regions uh, in the human brain. But of course, it's not anatomy alone. Just, you can't just extract function from, from wiring diagrams. You have to actually uh, 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 study the functions of the, of the elements in these circuits. And the technology for doing that is also uh, greatly advanced for both recording the activity electrically of neurons from large uh, numbers of neurons uh, distributed across systems. Of course, mostly this has happened in animals, but increasingly in humans using, uh, using uh, ECOG recordings uh, in uh, human epilepsy patients. And Christoph, for example, has done uh, some of that pioneering work. Um, and, um, and of course, using imaging methods in, in humans as well. And then uh, using optical tools to monitor activities of populations in animals. And, and here, I think a real key advance is being able to monitor the activity of these populations in awake behaving animals engaged in realistic tasks. And this is just an example of a head fixed mouse navigating through a virtual reality in, uh, environment uh, with its head fixed for optical uh, imaging from uh, David Tank's lab. And uh, in uh, you can run, run that one as well. And with a, a mouse navigating around like that, you can image the activity in, in large populations of cells. You can, and it's, it's a little uh, difficult to see there, but you can see cells popping on and off in a calcium imaging display. Uh, so you can actually uh, image these uh, populations in real, in real time. Of course, now that you have the wiring diagram, now that you have correlations between neuronal activity and behavior, uh, then you, have, you develop hypotheses which then need to be tested about what plays a causal role in a particular computation. And now we have tools, really revolutionary tools, uh, for uh, manipulating neural activity with light. And this is the, the uh, technology that Susan mentioned, uh, optogenetics. Uh, it was invented by Ed Boyden here, who's at uh, MIT, and Carl Dyseroff at Stanford. Uh, and the technique involves taking light-sensitive uh, uh, pr uh, pumps and channels from other organisms and using viruses to infect neurons with these so that neurons uh, can become sensitive to light. And then, if you can run that video, you then using currently fiber optic probes, but uh, very soon uh, uh, light from outside the head even, uh, you can stimulate uh, defined cell types uh, and then uh, look at the effects of these stimulated populations on other populations of circuits in the brain and then on ultimately on behavior. And then if you use, uh, we go, oh, sorry, go to the next. Next video, uh, using other uh, light-sensitive molecules and other wavelengths of light, you can turn cells off uh, as well. Again, with millisecond precision, the, working at the temporal scale, which with neurons themselves work uh, in the functioning brain. Um, sorry. Oops. <laughs> 
sorry. <laughs> Run that one. <laughs> and Ed, Ed Boyden working with engineers uh, here at MIT is, work, is developing tools for uh, um, uh, stimulating neurons and recording neurons basically throughout the entire mouse brain, uh, basically to understand the integration of these kinds of mechanisms really throughout widely distributed systems. It's really, really incredible work, uh, but of course, tools by themselves don't necessarily lead to insights. That you, but it, what it takes is putting very, very powerful tools into the hands of very clever people and clever people doing clever experiments. And I look particularly at our current generation of students and postdocs uh, who have these tools in our hands, and I am quite confident uh, that uh, as these tools are applied and, and we understand much more about the operation of neural circuits, uh, that uh, the uh, principles will emerge uh, and that they will collaborate with our colleagues in computation and cognitive scientists and so on, and that we will develop theories of how the brain solves important problems that can then be applied to intelligent machines as well. Thank you. Phil Sharp. So uh, why is it time to try again? Well, we never stop trying. Uh, and we're ongoing in trying to understand the brain. And uh, I have been asked to address the contributions of genomics to understanding brain and mind. And I'm going to take that in a fairly narrow context. We, genomics, as you will see, is advancing rapidly on the strength of our ability to sequence DNA. And uh, this has led to approaches to understanding the genetic underpinning of many uh, human mental states and diseases. And this has led to insights uh, and will lead to uh, very important insights into how the brain works. But genomics will also contribute to our understanding of how model systems works, such as mice and Drosophila and worms, and we know that the brain of humans is a higher order evolutionary derivative of those systems, and learning from those systems will lead us to further understanding of the brain, but I won't discuss that. As well as genomics and the ability to do rapid DNA sequencing will allow us to further analytically understand the structures in the brain. And this is going to be incredibly important when we think about a billion cells, each of those cells different from one another due to their wiring and assembly into a network, and to understand all of that at a level of the genes expressed and located in different parts of the cell is going to be fundamentally important. Let's look at the advances in DNA sequence as the product of the Human Genome Initiative. The initiative was uh, initiated in 1990 and 2003, 50 years after the discovery of the structure of DNA. It was completed, but the first draft was issued in 2001, exactly 10 years ago. And it has revolutionized our understanding and ability to do uh, molecular and cellular processes in, in human cells and in the human organism. But perhaps the most important aspect of that initiative was our ability to sequence DNA and how rapidly that has advanced and how important that has been in changing the world of biology. If you look at the rate of production of gigabases of DNA sequence produced by years, and this graph is from uh, Eric Lander, UC in 1999, a steady growth to 2006. From 2006 to 2008, a discontinuity, an increase in the rate of gigabases of, of DNA sequence per year. In uh, 2006 to 2009, an accelerated rate of increase of DNA sequences per year. And in 2010, off the charts. 2011, it continues. So how does that relate to what we do in the laboratory? Well, we basically have to run with resources to do it. Experiments, if you look here between 1999 and 2010, at uh, 1999, it was $20,000 per megabase. Uh, Moore's Law is shown in the middle. That's the rate of increase of capacity of computation over periods of time. And what you see is DNA sequencing is Moore's Law on steroids. 
We're now down to 0.2 dollars, 20 cents per megabase. And if you extrapolate that, and I don't know if you should or not, but I would anticipate that in a few years, you'll be able to do sequences of genome, a human genome sequence at a few hundred dollars per genome. It is now a few thousand per genome, and it is dependent on acceleration of technology. So we're going to have the ability to sequence humans very quickly and quite inexpensively, except in large populations. I want to then use a second example to illustrate where we're at, and that is the unraveling of genetic mysteries of psychotic illness, and this is from the work of Ed Skolnick, who's over at the Stanley Center in the Broad Institute, where they're applying genetic techniques to try to understand uh, schizophrenia and bipolar disease, and the risk factors are genetic contributions to those diseases. What you see here is an uh, indication of the genetic contribution to these uh, bipolar and schizophrenic conditions, and basically 50% of the risk to develop these uh, conditions are genetically transmitted through families. If you look at other traits that you might think of, of human behavior, uh, this is much stronger than most of those. Now, if you look at the issue of what is the common variance in the population, these are uh, alleles that are common among populations of people that when uh, found in an individual increases the risk of them in developing uh, a specific uh, schizophrenia or bipolar condition. Using common variance at 5%, they have over the last three or four years identified 12 specific gene regions that indicate risk of developing these psychotic conditions. Here's an example of the uh, locations on human chromosomes in which those uh, risk alleles are found, each of them uh, above the uh, order of 10 there, uh, 10 to the seventh, it's a log 10 plot, illustrates a risk loci and there are 12 illustrated across. It comes out of the analysis of approximately 30,000 patients and 30,000 controls looking at genetic segregation of alleles or gene regions in those populations. So over the last three years, they have been able to identify in a genetic disease 12 loci in which there are risk factors for the development of this uh, condition. One of those, as illustrated here, turns out to be a very interesting, for me, type of gene. It turns out that that risk factor is closest to uh, a microRNA. This is a gene encoding a small RNA in the genome. And in fact, not only is it a risk factor, but the four targets that it regulates, as far as we are able to determine with our current understanding of this gene, are also risk factors, illustrating that this circuitry has some relationship to an increased risk of developing these conditions. MicroRNAs were discovered only 10 years ago. We didn't know these types of genes existed. So what I'm saying is that with genomics, as we now are able to practice it, we're able to identify risk genes. And as we begin to understand what those risk genes are doing by looking at circuitry, we're beginning to see the complexity of biological systems. And it will take a decade to be able to translate this type of activity even into understanding how to treat possibly schizophrenia or manic depression. If we want to look at genomic approaches to other behavioral aspects, such as altruism or tendency to violence or the ability to memorize uh, various ex extraordinary tools, this is going to take a, a much more depth analysis in larger populations and probably using genomics looking at rare alleles. That projects off into the future. So my comments on genomics is genomics is revolutionizing our way to analyze biological systems, but it'll take us a number of years before genomics will be a major tool in understanding how human variation can be translated into how the brain works. 
and to lead us in terms of integrating the models that we're going to develop out of these computational tools into understanding the biological systems. So thank you. Christoph. No, for the, no, that's for tomorrow. All right, uh, my answer to the question of why, uh, why today is why not, today is good as day as any. Personally, I'm interested in understanding in my lifetime, uh, understanding consciousness is so the most central aspect of uh, our existence. And to understand consciousness, we need to understand things like intelligence, and we need to understand the brain, because the brain exudes consciousness, does it each and every waking day. In order to understand the brain, we need to re be to able to understand its element, make a complete list of all the elements, and the way they're interconnected, to be able to, we have to record from all of those uh, elements. We need to be able to model it in order to predict it, and we need to have theories so we know what we're looking for in these huge uh, databases. Now, on the next slide of today's presentation, no, well, when I came in, you showed me one with 10, you showed me a different one. No, it wasn't it. Oh, that's a bummer. Yeah, Peter, well, why didn't, uh, Peter, why didn't you talk? Okay. <laughs> we solved the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about consciousness. <laughs> the accent, the yeah. accent. Yeah. Make a good simulation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, when I'm asked to uh, talk about the future, I always think of these two guys. These are two famous 20th century philosophers who also had some success in other fields. Uh, and they're both known for saying uh, it's hard to predict, especially the future. And uh, these two guys uh, who won the uh, top scientific prizes in their respective fields are, are well known for saying the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And by the way, the fact that multiple people came up with these uh, discoveries is, is an instance of the idea of multiple discovery, uh, which is itself an idea that was discovered multiple times <laughs> uh, by people, in including these here. Uh, and I think this is one indication of why this is a good time, and that uh, you see this coming up and up over and over again. And uh, Susan was telling us how exciting it was to have all these different disciplines attacking the same problem and coming up with some of the same answers. And so that's one reason to be hopeful. Uh, and I, I love this idea of uh, multidisciplinary collaboration. And I think it's great to have the brain sciences and the mind and uh, computational together. But I noticed I was outnumbered by you brain guys. So <laughs> I'm going to focus on, in my talk on the uh, computer side. But uh, I, I still love the brain side. <laughs> OK, so let, let's uh, narrow the topic down and say, within artificial intelligence, uh, why is it time to try again? And, and notice that the, the topic has a, a presupposition of the answer. It is, isn't, is it time, but why is it? Uh, and I think part of the, the theory is, you know, we had this golden age of, and we heard some of that yesterday, of uh, back in the, in the 50s and 60s, it was like, well, we're just going to take a decade or two, and we're going to have this problem solved. And everybody was going to work together, and it was going to be great. And then it turned out to be harder than we thought. And then the field began to fragment. And so we no longer have uh, one AI conference. We have dozens of them, and they each have their own journals, and they're each attacking a narrow part of the field. And, and some people are thinking, well, well maybe that we've gone wrong in doing that, and maybe we should all come back together. Is that right? Uh, well, well, let's uh, make an analogy and let's say uh, life sciences. Uh, is it time for them to try again? And in life sciences, we had a, a golden age. And, <laughs> and here in uh, 1818, uh, Dr. Frankenstein is doing uh, some of the seminal early work. <laughs> and uh, he thought, uh, you know, he's going to be able to, to put together a, a working life form uh, within one career. Uh, but that turned out to be fictional. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so what, what do we have? Uh, well, it depends on where you look. And so if you go to MIT, I list, look for the list of departments, and they have a department of biology, good for them. And they're all together happily and doing great work. 
but if you go uh, across the country and look at Stanford, uh, they have seven departments of biology. <laughs> and so I think there's room, and I, you know, I don't want to get into a discussion of who's better, uh, the, the MIT approach or the Stanford approach, but I think there's room for lots of viewpoints, and there are splitters and there are joiners, and maybe it's time to come together, and maybe it's time to come apart, and it's all doing good work, and in order to get the final answer, we need lots of good components, and we have to put those components together. And whether we get that from top down or bottom up, I think is more a question of style. So uh, artificial intelligence again, first why, and secondly, is it time? And in order to answer this question, I decided I'd do some research. So, I, uh, <laughs> I chose uh, a research tool that, that I enjoy using. Uh, so I went to Google Scholar and I clicked on the uh, computer science subfield and I looked for the, the field artificial intelligence. And in addition to that, I put in the phrase unlike previous. And what I wanted to get at was what are people saying about why it's different now and what I'm doing now is different than what it was in the past. And, and of course, everybody's got to say that or else they won't publish your papers. Uh, <laughs> But let's just get a sampling of those phrases. And there you see some examples, and uh, you know, you'd be happy to see that number two there was a very influential paper by a graduate of this institution. Uh, then you can plot them over time, and you see, uh, well, yeah, it seems like there's more of these papers that match that criteria in current uh, years, but then there's more of everything on the web in current years. So really, there's no pattern. And, and basically, it's just stochastic, and over all the decades, People talk about new stuff uh, with pretty much constant rate. Uh, then what are they talking about? So I just picked out some examples. And uh, from paper in 1968, they're saying, unlike previous methods, my method learns from examples. And then <laughs> here's some other ones. We're representing different states. Uh, we have real-time parallel algorithms. We're collaborating. Uh, in 1998, again, we're learning from examples, and <laughs> unlike previous. Uh, then uh, we started to get into this uh, stochastic stuff in the, in the 90s, uh, and then in the 2000s, we're getting into large uh, training sets, and in 2010, we have the breakthrough of learning from examples. <laughs> so again, uh, it doesn't seem like we're at a unique point in time. It seems like uh, uh, there's lots of opportunity now, yes, but you can't tell by looking at the data that uh, that this is better than, as you're saying, the 149th or the 151st anniversary or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. In fact, if you had asked me at what decade was the most exciting time, I probably would have said uh, 1990 rather than 2010 or, or 2011, because in 1990, we had just come up with uh, Pearl's uh, and its colleagues' uh, probabilistic approach, and there was a feeling of, yeah, this old-fashioned AI was uh, restricted to using logical formalism, and that's not very good for dealing with uncertainty. And now we have this new methodology of probability, so now we can solve all the problems. And, and that methodology has been very, very fruitful, but it's been 20 years, and we haven't solved everything yet. Uh, so it doesn't seem like, like now is unique, but it's still a great time to try again. Uh, and what do we need if we want to actually have success? And so rather than saying, is it a great time to try? To try? Yes, it always is. But what pieces should we try to put together uh, so that we can try and succeed? And I think there's uh, four pieces, representation, reasoning, learning, and interaction in, with the world. So in representation and reasoning, we want to be able to combine uh, certain and uncertain reasoning, and there's some progress in that lately in these uh, first-order probabilistic languages from Daphne Kohler, uh, um, from Stuart Russell, from Pedro Dominguez, from uh, Josh and, and his students. We need to be able to combine hierarchical levels, have multiple levels of representation, uh, and that's the problem Chomsky was talking about yesterday, Pat Winston was talking about, and so on. We need to be able to chain things together over time. Uh, and uh, Jeff has talked convincingly about that. We need to handle uh, context dependency, and well, I think one the most uh, telling uh, weakness or brittleness of earlier AI systems is that they tried to abstract away all the context and write everything down as a simple logical rule, and then when you apply it to a different context, it never works. Uh, some of AI has focused on chaining together reasoning steps. So how do I play chess 
by saying, well, if I do this, and then if you do that, and I do this, and you do that, uh, then I can win. Uh, that's been a big focus for AI. I think that's one of the least important parts, at least the part of chaining when we have to do with uh, logical steps, as in chess, maybe chaining together in the forms of simulation of the world, of an uncertain world, is a more appropriate part of sort of normal intelligence and not this very specialized uh, chess style intelligence. Uh, then for learning, uh, what do we have to do? Here I think the, uh, the techniques that are necessary are more kind of technical. So first, we have to learn over representations that are more than a mapping from a vector of real numbers into another uh, real number. Uh, we have to be able to combine these various parts I mentioned previously, and we need to do that continuously. Uh, current learning algorithms are specified as you give me a bunch of data, and I'll do some inference over it, I'll give you the results. But we want to live in the real world when data is coming in uh, continuously and when there's large amounts of it, and we want to deal with it efficiently. And so, uh, and then interaction, we want to observe the world. Uh, so again, uh, one of the great philosophers said you can observe a lot just by watching, and that was Yogi, not Niels. Uh, we want to be able to move about and touch things in the world, learn by doing, asking, reading, and seeing. Uh, and finally, I'll, I'll close with the words of a, another philosopher and linguist. This was uh, Larry Wall, the inventor of the Perl programming language, and this is his motto, and it stands for, there's more than one way to do it. <laughs> so let's try with Christoph again. <laughs> All right, let's do 2.0. Right, so the, the, the secret to intelligence, human level intelligence, is neocortex. So neocortex, uh, think of it as a two plus epsilon dimensional computational tissue that was discovered by, by natural selection roughly 100 million years ago. It's two plus epsilon, because if you look at a different extent species today, the width of this tissue varies maybe by factor of two from one millimeter, or maybe factor four, one and a half millimeter to four millimeter, but the extent varies roughly a factor of uh, over, over five orders of magnitude. So there you can see some rodents and some, uh, in some uh, 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 human brain. So the surface area, let's say, between a mouse and us varies roughly by a factor of 2,000. So you, apparently it's a very successful strategy given that mammals are pretty much have populated the most ecological niches on the planet. It appears to be a very successful evolutionary strategy, whatever the, 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 the secret uh, computational um, recipe is behind cortex. So we, need, uh, we, we really need to understand that. Uh, then we, I think we've understood how, um, how, uh, how, um, how mammals work. The problem is a lot of neurons. In mouse, there's roughly 70 million neurons, of which 13 million neurons are in cortex. Remember that, that number, 13 million. In humans, there are roughly 1,000 times more. There are 86 billion neurons and 16 billion in, uh, in cortex. We need to be able to record from uh, we'd like to be able to record from every neuron. We need to, rep to record from a representative large number of them. Now, the trouble is there's not just one or two types of neurons, like in the old neural network models, excited inhibitory. There could easily be between 100 and 1,000 different cell types. And so we need to be able to record from, from representative numbers of, the, of uh, all of these cell types. Uh, we don't have a list of these neuronal building blocks. We have a list of them, a fairly complete list in the retina. It's on the order of 50 different cell types. In this piece of neural engineering, we don't know what it is in cortex or in, um, in basal ganglia. Uh, we really need that. We have no accepted standards for defining relevant phenomena. So, for example, if you care about, 40, uh, or about things like uh, oscillation, large-scale phenomena, synchrony, synphite chain, sharp wave, et cetera, you can get two papers published in the same issue of the same journal that flatly disagree uh, with each other. One says, well, obviously, they're there. The other person, the next group, obviously, say, well, says, obviously, they're not there. Um, th that's partly because we have no accepted common standards. It's a reflection of the field. It's ultimately a reflection of the underlying uh, academic structures where you have on the order of 10,000 labs, are roughly between 50 and 60,000 neuroscientists worldwide, and you have on the order of 10,000 labs that are rapidly moving off in all possible direction. Of course, they have to maximally differentiate themselves because that's how you get uh, tenure and, uh, and publish. So we have, ve we have no common project as compared, for example, to astrophysics that every 10 years does a survey where the, the field as a whole agrees on what are the big questions and what are the big instruments that need to be built. So um, well, what I'd like to do, I'd like to build a, a, a device that Francis Crick and I wrote about more than 20 years ago called a Brain TV. Never mind, you don't need to read that. Essentially what we want, we want to be able to record from all the neurons in cortex of a smooth 
of a smooth surface animal such as a mouse. So that's essentially, think of a TV, 3,500 by 3,500 pixel. I like to, it's a black and white, and unfortunately it's only one bit, it's not, it's not three times um, eight bits on each pixel. And I like to be able to watch brain TV and then understand what goes on. Right now what we're doing, if you're conservative, you're recording from one pixel. That's what still a lot of electrophysiologists do. If you are really aggressive, you're recording from maybe 100 or 1,000 pixels. So that's a little square, 30 by 30 pixel of this gigantic 30 million um, array. That's obviously utterly completely insufficient. Furthermore, we don't know where we're recording from. So the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of electrophysiology is done, you blindly stick a uh, a, a brain into a piece of tissue, let's say in a particular area X, and then you, you have no idea what, you're t um, what neuron you are, you, you're querying. You just know it's a neuron, you do statistics. That's like trying to find out about people by sticking a microphone in front of a person without knowing anything about the person, without knowing who the person is, whether they're female or male, or whether they belong to particular sports teams, whatever. So, uh, but we now have the tools, as uh, Bob beautifully showed in his uh, presentation, we now have the tool in hand. So now over the, um, I've just recently moved to the Allen Institute to be the, uh, the chief scientific officer at the Allen Institute, and there we would like to implement this, um, this, um, these visions in concrete reality over, over the next, uh, over the next uh, decade. What is the Allen Institute for Brain Science? It's an independent, non-for-profit organization founded in 2001, endowed by, and, and uh, endowed by an in initial gift by um, Jody and, um, and Paul Allen, and they continue to, uh, to fund it, although it gets roughly one third of its funding and from, uh, from, other, for, uh, from other support. It's a really basic research in the, in the, in the brain sciences. So the, the, their, their products are these large-scale releases of databases like brain atlases. Probably uh, many of you will know about the mouse brain atlas or about the, the, the human brain atlas, or now about the, the, Cree, um, the Cree driver um, uh, mice, where, where, where the institute generates specific mice, where you've identified, genetically identified and targeted specific cell types that you can turn on and off. This is all, um, anybody can, can access those data. There's no licensing, no IP. There are roughly 155 people, 30 PhD. That's the current state, it's gonna expand. Um, so it's not a traditional PI-driven re, uh, research in, institution, so it's, let's say, not like Genelia Farm, uh, where you have, you know, 30 different labs that, that are all doing their own independent research. And it's also not an extramural funding agency. Some people confuse us with that. Um, so this is one of the, 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 the high-throughput uh, platform. What they've done in the past is these high-throughput platforms where they take, let's say, they sequence all the 23,000 genes in the, in the brain and then um, express it throughout the brain and all of that data is accessible on roughly 80 million images that you can download together with a beautiful three-dimensional um, uh, three tool where you can click and you get the nissel stain and you get the individual where, let's say, in layer, f in layer four of V1 is this particular gene expressed. And something similar is happening for, for they just release this, data, uh, this database for two humans. These are two um, adult neurologically healthy um, uh, human brains where they uh, release very similar data. Now that's all static, but now the, the donor is very interested in moving towards uh, dynamic things, towards, to do what's doing electrophysiology and trying to understand the problem of coding and decoding of, of, um, of information. So, uh, so they're really at, um, at uh, strategy of three steps. One is to build a brain observatory. So I'm at Caltech. At Caltech, one of our projects is something called the TMT, the 30-meter telescope. So this was um, initiated by the, by the astrophysics community several years ago, where the need was for a large telescope that has an effective diameter of 30 meter, light gathering diameter of 30 meter, built by having 541 independent hexagonal mirrors that are much smaller. This entire 6,000 ton heavy device is gonna be vibrated at 100, at 100 hertz to do adaptive optics to remove the effect of the, of the atmosphere. It's, in, in the, it's a monarchy. It's a 10 years project. First slide is 2018, roughly a billion dollars, 150 people. There's no reason why we can't spend similar efforts, similar ingenuity, similar brain resources, similar sort of resources to peer not outside at the beginning of time and space, but at the beginning of mind inside our own brain, and that's what we want to do. So the, 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 the technologies are really the ones that, that Bob had talked about, but we like to focus on a single, on a single um, sort of uh, problem, and uh, think of it like the, uh, a mouse. So we'd like to really understand the mouse and try to image as many cells as we can. Um, so let's say starting out maybe with 10,000 cells, we'll use advanced silicon probes of the sort that, that uh, Ed Boyden's building here successfully, together with, uh, with calcium imaging, like, like David Tang does in behaving, in behaving animal, and do that at, at, in a high throughput in uh, um, many parallel setups using computer automated uh, behavioral evaluation and a highly standardized condition. So it's, you know, you do the same, the similar, or the same um, type of animal uh, on the same type of day and a highly standardized 
standardized conditions so the data is really high quality. This includes, this project has to include a using uh, genetic tools together with uh, neuroanatomy and electrophysiology, has to include a complete description of all the, of all the cell types in, in the cortical thalamic system because we have to know the different cell types that are there. And of course, as uh, Bob talked about, uh, we want to move from, from, uh, from correlation to causation. We want to be able to intervene selectively, for example, to enable to build something that Francis Crick and I dreamed about and wrote about extensively, for example, a zombie mouse, a mouse that where you knock out all the feedback connections from a higher order cortical areas to lower level cortical areas where you would expect certain deficits in its behavior and its attention and its learning ability, for instance. Uh, then we develop open source uh, st uh, standards for recording analysis statistics and put all of that uh, uh, data online. The importance is to focus on a few behavior, not do 50 different behaviors, 50 different people, but to do you know, one or two or three behaviors and to record from as many cells in as many layers in as many relevant areas of cortex and subcortical structure as, um, as possible. Um, so that's, the, that's one of the, 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 the early milestones to record on the order of, of, um, of 10,000 genetically identifiable cells. So we know we're now recording from a layer 5 cell that sits in layer 5 of a particular place in cortex and it projects down, for instance, to the pulmonar. At the same time, it's really essential um, uh, um, uh, it's really essential that we also have a model because if you have all these different experiments, you've got to be able to put it all together in one package as a way to understand the whole from a holistic point of view. So it's really essential to do large-scale model. It's going to be part of this a computational strategy where we use sophisticated sort of biophysical accurate anatomical correct um, models of the, of, the, of the relevant region of the, um, of the brain. At, in order to fit all the data into some sort of quantitative understanding so we can really understand at the quantitative level what are the series of transformations that lead, let's say, from an image, transforming up retina, LGN, V1, AL, all the different cortical areas down to motor structures on the other end. And what's really essential um, and what, what, uh, what, what you've rightfully emphasized before is neglected is the role of theory. You don't, unless you really know what you're looking for, you're not going to find it. And, and we, and, and this is already a problem today in the field where we're generating huge amount of genomic or electrophysiological data, and we're not quite sure what to look for. So we have to have specific theories where, where, where we know what we're looking for. And so, for instance, one of the, um, one of the theories besides the one we're going to talk about tomorrow, Integrated Theory of, inform of um, Integrated Information of Consciousness by Giulio Tononi, are things like, uh, like, uh, like HMAX, a model that, that my, that my uh, doctor father here um, and developed over the last 10 years. I think this, is, this slide's now been shown for the first time. <laughs> Third time, you should all be primed to it. But it, it, it makes a series of prediction in, 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 um, for primate, both in monkey at the physiological level as well as for human at the psychophysical level, about which stages in cortical processing in, in vision uh, subserve which specific function. So the nice thing about it, it makes some very specific predictions. And what's the role of a feed forward connection versus feedback connection? There's no reason at all now with sophisticated visual behavior that it's now become possible in the mouse to not do the same sort of experiment in, in mice at a, at a very comprehensive level where you can record for most of those. Those numbers are, of course, not for the mouse, but you have to adapt those numbers to the mouse and then do similar experiments in the mouse to really come in, over the next 10 years to come to an understanding of, um, of cortex and thereby further the study of, um, of natural intelligence. Thank you. Shimon Ullman. Okay, so intelligence or the effort to understand intelligence is very much an integrative, inherently an integrative um, effort that puts together a number of different disciplines and a number of different levels of understanding, and I would like to spend briefly a few moments talking about some aspects of this integration, uh, some recent directions, and some things that uh, uh, we should be doing. So certainly intelligence needs to be understood uh, using a number of different scientific disciplines, uh, and this is inherently in sort of um, uh, Necessarily so, because eventually a satisfactory explanation of intelligence uh, should allow us to understand the computational aspects of cognition. We want to understand the brain structure. We want to understand how uh, innate capacities are encoded in our genes and so forth. So we'll have to be put uh, all of these things together. As we already heard, at least uh, in part, one thing that can make us somewhat optimistic about this challenging or daunting task of putting all of these things together is the emergence of really remarkable uh, new tools within each field that are going to help us 
uh, both within a field and also to make some connections uh, among and between different, uh, different areas. So already mentioned were genomics, um, optogenetics, uh, recent advantage, uh, advances in brain imaging uh, have been very uh, important. For example, uh, fMRI that allow us, allows us to see and read brain activity in humans while they are performing conscious intelligent tasks. Uh, also TMS that allows us to interfere with brain activity while a person is doing a cognitive uh, particular task. And this really allows us to test in a way that uh, we're not ways that were not possible before to associate brain activation with uh, cognitive tasks and computational theories. Um, it, closer to my own theory, there have been enormous advances in computation, and I should say that it's not only tools. Tools have been very important. Uh, some important theoretical uh, new developments, for example, we already heard that learning has been important from the beginning, but I think it has only been recently that we understand much better and at a deeper theoretical level how to do, uh, how to do learning, and the emergence of new tools, uh, processing power, memory, the existence of the web, and collective data. Let me show you one uh, amusing example, ni nice example from recent work, which was uh, building Rome in one day. Um, a part of what we do with our visual system is to continuously construct models of our environment to get the three-dimensional structures of objects and scenes around us and to build a model of what of the world around us. Now, based on the emerging theories that have been developed over recent years about concerning this um, reconstruction of the environment, a team at Microsoft Research uh, recently put together um, um, a very impressive system to implement and test these theories of reconstruction. Turns out if you click Rome in, uh, into Flickr, you get back something like two million or over two million photographs taken by tourists in Rome uh, in a random fashion. Different people over different time, different locations, indoor, outdoors. Um, they took all of these uh, photographs automatically. There is no human intervention. Selected automatically a subset of those, about 150,000 uh, images, and then used automatic reconstruction techniques on those, and you can see some of the results that came out. So you just clicked Rome, and this is what came out, a model of the uh, Trevi Fountain, the Colosseum, inside the, uh, you see also inside things, like the inside the Pantheon, and many, many other parts of Rome have been reconstructed automatically by just clicking um, Rome in the computer and then putting to use the huge amount of data, processing, memory, and theories that have emerged about three-dimensional and scene reconstruction uh, in recent years. So this is one aspect of integration, but another aspect which is, uh, has emerged as very, very important is integration across different cognitive domains. So intelligence involves a number of different domains, and including perception, action, language, reasoning, social cognition, and so on. And certainly we have to understand the different components and then how they are put together in order to form intelligent behavior. But what emerged recently is something that uh, um, received more prominence and we appreciate more the, under, the uh, importance of is that the connections and the integra integration between these models comes early, early in the processing stages and early in uh, human in infant development. So vision and action planning, for example, are highly interconnected. Language and things like perception and social cognition are highly interconnected. So integration is early in this sense. And let me show you in an example, a couple of examples, what I mean. So for example, if you try to do action recognition, you look at these images and the question is, what are these people doing? Uh, it's easy to see that what, what they do, what they have in common, all of them are engaged in drinking. But if you think about these as, as images, as a constellation of visual features that are, of course, extremely different from one another. Here are even more difficult ones in terms of uh, the direct connection between this and drinking, but we immediately, when we look at such images, we understand what is happening in these images. On the other hand, there can be images that, in terms of the visual constellation of, of features in the image, are quite similar to the ones above, but here uh, we can clearly, and within very time, a short time frame, understand that they are engaged in other uh, activities. So we can see from this that action recognition, doing it from vision, really requires much more than vision. 
Uh, we have to understand that drinking is about bringing, bringing liquid to the mouth without spilling it. Um, and for this, it turns out that it, it becomes very useful to combine, at the very early stages, action planning with vision. For example, if you know how you yourself take a glass and use it in order to drink, you know that you have to be careful not to tilt it too much and uh, to avoid yeah, the liquid from spilling. So the axis of the container that you are moving to your mouth is very important. And it turns out that we immediately extract that when we look at images of people performing action. So the visual system is instructed by the planning component, which features are important. And this very early on in the very early stages of doing feature extraction from the image, it's already being ins instructed by modules which are not directly vision. Similarly, in language learning, we know that it's not just language, it's not just syntax and rewriting rules and so on, but learning language combines from the beginning uh, perceptual and social cues that make learning language much more uh, efficient. And one of the cues which are being used is being able to um, infer and follow direction of gaze. So when we hear somebody uttering a word or when infants hear somebody uttering, uttering a word, then they use also the cues that they can look at the eyes of the other person and they can infer what is the object that this person is looking at. So following, understanding, direction of gaze is something that comes um, uh, in the very early um, uh, ages of, uh, er stages of infant development, already at very few uh, a, uh, months of age, uh, this is already happening automatically, sort of a reflex of following somebody else's uh, direction of gaze. This is interesting because it turns out to be very difficult. <laughs> if you look at this person, maybe the image is not large enough or uh, the resolution may be slightly low for some of you, but I think you can, you can tell that this person is not looking at the table, for example, but sort of looking directly at us. If you look at the eye region, um, which is shown on the right, what do we really make the uh, uh, inference based on, you can see that the information is really not very salient, not very clear, but it's something that somehow we, or infants at already uh, four or five months of age, they are very sensitive to this, they pick it up and they use it in order to trigger their behavior and follow the direction of gaze. So it shows us that non-salient features are very early on and automatically extracted and used, we know that infants do it, but things like that have not been yet modeled and used successfully in computer and artificial vision systems. And there is strong indication that many of these um, processes are guided by innate biases and proto-concepts that the uh, system already knows from the beginning what to focus on and how the features that it extracts should trigger behavior and what to do next in order to, um, uh, to continue. So let me skip over this and get to the summary that I think major new directions uh, that we need to follow and we have the uh, new basis for is early integration between different cognitive domains and the integration of innate structures with learning from multimodal experience, namely all different sensory modalities uh, and actions. And an example of a challenging research project that uh, I think now is the kind of thing that it's becoming possible and becoming useful to explore and something that uh, comes closer to my field is uh, developing a model of a digital baby, sort of modeling how a baby infant develops over, say, the first year of life, including in such modeling effort would be uh, an explication of the innate capaci capacities that you need in order, to, in order to guide the system through the correct developmental trajectories in order to collect the right and use the right kind of information, a system like this will then watch an, an, a large number of images and potentially other sensory signals, not necessarily visual, and it would like to watch and to model how eventually within a system like that, with any other, without any other explicit supervision, uh, uh, the system like this starts to develop concepts about objects and actions and agents and goals and tools uh, and interactions between agents and so on. Um, so I think this is becoming plausible and becoming a realistic uh, research challenge and direction uh, as an example of combining the innate structures with continuous learning and as an example of integrating early across different cognitive domains. So thank you very much.
So with Shimon, we have now uh, ended the official short statements or talks by the panelists. Josh will take over um, running the discussion. And you may start with some comments, introduction. OK. So, uh, this is great. This is a wonderful set of perspectives. Uh, I want I, I to just get to a very few set of comments just kind of by way of discussion and try to also be a little bit challenging to get some of the integration going here. There's really two questions, and these why questions. There's why is it time to try again in the sense of like, why should we or can we and why must we? And I want to put some imperative behind that. Um, so a lot of the excitement about AI is coming from industry and AI applications. Pretty, I, I'd say a week doesn't go by when some, somebody from the press is, is calling me up and saying, I'm writing an article on AI, and what's your take, and what do you think about Watson or Google or whatever? And great. Um, but what we have in all of these applications, whether we have you know, uh, information retrieval and web search and machine translation from Google or IBM playing chess and Jeopardy, detecting faces, pedestrians, uh, mobile eye. It's great stuff. But in each case, what we, what we have is a, a sort of proof of concept, a principle, that if you take a well-defined task and you throw enough resources at it, enough data, computing time, enough smart, clever engineers, you can build a system that for that task achieves some kind of you know, human level, maybe even you know, world-class expert level uh, performance on that task. But the thing about intelligence and in, in human intelligence, as several of our speakers, particularly earlier in the day today, emphasize, is that there isn't a task, right? The same human brain can do all of those things. The same human brain doesn't just play chess or Jeopardy, but can play football and baseball and uh, Tetris and Angry Birds and learn to you know, negotiate for a house or negotiate for a car, or negotiate a job offer, or negotiate a relationship, um, learn to speak any language or learn to dance a foxtrot or play the piano and all that sort of thing. So <laughs> there's something remaining to be gotten at there. And I think that <laughs> the, the study of the human mind and brain provide uh, both you know, the phenomena of what we should be looking at and something about the, the mechanisms at both the software and hardware levels. So that's one point. Um, a second point, uh, this idea of new data, new tools and technologies um, absolutely fundamental. So we, we, several, several of our colleagues talked about uh, the biology side, neuroscience, genomics, and so on. And for me, one of my uh, jobs, day jobs is doing cognitive psychology, running experiments with human subjects. And we also have, have, have had our field transformed by new technologies, like, for example, Mechanical Turk. Um, we can now run a sort of high throughput behavior nomics, or whatever you want to call it, um, running experiments with large numbers of human subjects orders of magnitude cheaper and faster than any psychologist ever could before. And that allows us to get much richer quantitative data to test computational models. And as you, if you saw Rebecca Sachs's talk today, she, of course, is, is combining human behavior with cognitive neuroscience. But also, that, that thing where she was having you kind of raise your hand. So the, the way she actually drives that is by asking these questions on Mechanical Turk. And basically, she can combine Turk and fMRI to understand, you know, map out theory of mind and morality networks. That's very exciting. So this is all exciting. But you know, it, this just makes, again, an imperative for theory. So Christoph made this point. But I just want to drive it home by saying, you know, imagine that here's a thought experiment that many of us, I think, have proposed versions of this. You could call it the neuroscientist dream. Right? Imagine that we had all the data you could possibly want and all the experimental control. So we've mapped out the entire connectome of the brain at, er at arbitrary spatial detail. We could record from what every neuron is doing in arbitrary temporal detail and spatial detail inside every little bit of a neuron. Because as Jeff said, I completely agree, neurons, e even a single neuron is quite complex. We could control all the stimuli in a perfect virtual reality simulator. And with optogenetics, we could control and intervene on every single bit of every single circuit as we liked. Then what? For those of you who saw Andrew Lowe's talk, um, where he described how hard it was to figure out how to get dressed in the morning and combine you know, the right suit and jacket and shoes and belt and socks, this is just a little bit harder. Right? The combinatorics here are a little bit bigger. Where do you even start with an experiment? What's a meaningful question to ask? As Bob said, we need clever experiments done by clever people. But that's just too unconstrained, I think. And I think we need theory. And the premise of, of the intelligence initiative that Tommy and I and many others here have been working on is that the tools of engineering, broadly speaking, provide the theory for intelligence. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is reverse engineer how the brain and the mind works. And we think we can do that by drawing theories from the, the, the engineering side of computation. It, engineering also provides a test bed. There's you know, hundreds of years of brain theory. But many of them, I'd say argue most, if not well, all of them, 
don't work in the sense that if you run them on the data that comes into the brain, they don't produce the outputs that the brain produces at the functional or behavioral level. We know that because we don't have AI yet. So the one tool of progress is using engineering and AI, including standard task applications, but also more increasing integrative tasks like the kind of things that Shimon was talking about, as test beds to know whether our theories of the brain actually work. Uh, point two. Point three, um, again to echo uh, something that, that Peter talked about and a number of us, the, um, the emergence of a common set of tools at the theoretical and mathematical level. Um, let me tell one quick story from, the, from uh, the, the, days of, the early days of cognitive science. Ed Smith, some of you might remember him, um, was uh, one of the key players in early cognitive psychology and cognitive science. He was at BBN down the road and also had an adjunct appointment at MIT. And he said, the early days of co cognitive science, the 60s, the 70s, those were really exciting. But we'd all come together and then and talk, you know, philosophers, linguists, computer scientists, psychologists, biologists. We talk about stuff, but then we go home to our labs and just go back to our normal daily lives and, and lose that, that contact. And it never really went anywhere integratively because we didn't have a common language. And what's very exciting, and one of the reasons why, why now, is the kind of things that Peter was talking about, common theoretical, mathematical, computational ideas. Like, just like Peter, I would, I would cite the rise in the early 1990s, for, for me personally, as the most exciting um, sort of theoretical, mathematical development, Bayesian networks, probabilistic models, and so on. And, and I think there's a good reason why it's taken almost 20 years from then to, to be, be thinking about the kind of integrative effort. One is that it took that long for those sets of ideas to diffuse across all these fields. And it's quite remarkable. I think almost all the panelists here, in their own work or in their labs or their companies, are using the math of probability theory and statistics in some way, whether they're doing biology at the genomic level, neuroscience, whether they're doing behavior, whether they're doing AI, or computer vision, or whatever. So that diffusion is you know, now we can speak the same theoretical language. But also, it took that time to realize how to take that math and combine it with other math. Because as people like Marvin Minsky and Noam Chomsky and others from the Golden Age said yesterday, you know, there isn't a magic bullet. Probability and statistics is not a magic bullet. And one of the things we've learned, Peter was referring to some of these things like various kinds of probabilistic logic or probabilistic programming languages. We've learned just in the last few years how to combine what you could call the math of data, probability and statistics, which with the other great kind of math, you could call it the math of knowledge, logic, symbols, structured representations that you heard about, say, from the linguists earlier today, and put these together. And th just those two kinds of math are hugely much more powerful than either one before. They allow you to get beyond some of the kind of either-or debates, like the, the narrative that Steve Pinker was asking about that says, you know, it's either symbols and, and logic or it's numbers and statistics. And a lot of the most exciting work going on right now is coming from being able to do probabilistic inference over rich symbolic knowledge. <laughs> To, to do, in particular, some of the things that in our Golden Age panel yesterday people were calling for, like Barbara Partee was saying, you've got to pay attention to semantics and pragmatics. And some of the most exciting work in natural language right now, for, for example, by Regina Barzilay here in Seasale, or Percy Lang out at Berkeley, or Luke Zettelmoyer, who was a student here but is now at University of Washington, is doing exactly that, doing statistical learning and, and probabilistic inference over lambda calculus representations of semantics and pragmatics that those that the linguists have been telling us, that's what you need to do. Or, for example, Marvin often likes to say, all the statistics in the world is not going to tell you why if I you know, take a stick or a pen, I can push or pull something. But if I have a string, I can pull, but I can't push. And he's exactly right. You need something like a, sort of a rich analog simulation of physical forces. But one of the things we've learned how to do quite recently, this is some work that in particular I'm kind of excited about and we're working on, is to combine these and to be able to do probabilistic inference over physical force simulations. And that allows us to, to actually take the idea of a physical force model and use it in a noisy world, learn and reason and handle what's which really ultimately a problem of guesswork. It's physics, but it's also guesswork. So that's very exciting. Um, should we, have we said, <laughs> okay. um, and uh, no, that's good, that's probably enough. Um, so would you like an answer to that question? <laughs> well, okay, um, uh, how are we doing on time? We're, we, we were, supposed to, we're supposed to go, we started about 15 minutes late and they said we should go, so we have about half an hour. Um, no, you want? 20 minutes. Okay. No, no, um, no, the audience is gonna. Well, I was just gonna. We don't have an uh, hour. I was going to remark on one more lesson that I think we've learned, which is important, which is just as we didn't really have computing power the last few times we tried this convergence, we've learned to be, to, uh, not to be too cautious. We've learned that things that, that, that seem impossible now, if we wait a couple of decades, our computer power will catch up with us. 
And I think that's absolutely fundamental. You can go back and read early AI papers, even from a you know, couple of decades ago, where people say, well, here's the right way to set up this problem. But that would require solving a system of hundreds of simultaneous linear equations. And well, no one can ever do that, so we'll do some other heuristic or hack. And, and you know, the idea of what Google could do just seemed ridiculous then. So I would encourage people, particularly like the students here, to think ambitiously and adventurously. And don't be afraid to work on problems that, you know, for example, doing probabilistic inference over physics, that maybe it's not clear how to scale it up to Google size scale yet, because you know, as this, as this uh, trajectory goes on, these things will become possible. All right, well, that, that was my take on you know, why now and all this. Um, as far as the discussion part of things, we had a couple of questions. Uh, I'm ha well, I'm happy if any of the panelists want to respond to those challenges. Um, let me also just put out three kind of questions that we got by email. And feel free to anybody who wants to jump in and respond to any of these things. Um, one, uh, a few questions. One was the idea of, um, well, going back to what, what Peter said, you know, there's more than one way to do it. So is there more than one way to do it? Like, does AI actually need the minor brain? Or why should we, I mean, do we need it? So I'm claiming we do, but some of, some of our questioners are skeptical about that. Is it a good idea, or is it, or is it actually necessary? Um, Another question that came up is, what, you know, we've heard this a little bit in some of the other panels, but I'd like to hear this, this group's take on it. What's holding us back in the sense of what are the biggest things that we don't understand that we need to understand? And also, I want to bring back a question that Tommy asked, what, what we should be wary of. What are the biggest things that we think we understand that maybe we don't, actually? So with that, anyone wants to jump in, go for it. And then we'll also turn it over to, to you guys for questions after our panelists have had their... Yeah, the level of the brain, we still, we st I mean, we, we see it. We have uh, Sidney Brenner uh, mentioned yesterday, since 25 years, we have the complete wiring diagram of C. elegant. At some point, we'll have, at least at a very rough scale, the connectome at a much cruder scale, or the projectome of mouse and of flying of mouse. We can record from large uh, uh, parts of single neurons. We can do fMRI to get the whole brain. But putting it all together is just proving to be ever more difficult, because the closer we look in the genomics and the neuroanatomy and the physiology, the more complexity we see, right? There no, so if you look at all the, the, the marriage of genomics and brain science, there's no very simple patterns that emerge. There are incredible complicated statistical patterns that emerge. There's no simple understanding. So ultimately, how it all gets put together into this holistic, wonderful, functioning brain that can do all the things you mentioned it remains still fundamentally very mysterious. I mean, but that requires theory. That's why we need. But, I mean, that's know, why seeing is conditional sine qua non. Complexity is a symptom of lack of understanding. Anything you don't understand looks complex, and and so I, I'm not sure what you're saying, Christoph. But you the know, brain I'm, is complex, not a lack of understanding. It's just the way the brain is. So no, but I, I disagree. I disagree. I mean, a computer is amazingly complex if you didn't understand what it did too. It's much more right. No, it, it's not. No, the, right, if you look right, at the structure right, of the brain, uh, it's uh, of the. Right. Uh, well, they disagree. So that's CPU, it's vastly simpler. Let me, let you have the just, same let, type of transistor. It's the same type of memory cell. Well, I guess I'm wrong. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I disagree. I, I disagree, and I and I think this has been uh, the, this has been a, a failure of the collective uh, people who've been working on this is to think that the brain is the most complex thing in the universe and all this kind of stuff. It, it, it is complex, but all all complex systems, when you get to the fundamental principles by which they work, then you can you can excuse a lot of the data and you say I don't need to understand all that. I don't need to understand all of this. And I argue that you have there are fundamental information processing elements that are common in neural systems. And if you understand those, then, then you have a framework for understanding the, the complexity. And it won't seem as complex. So if we, if we think that the way to solve this is to, is to you know, build a model of everything, it's like if I wanted to understand you know, what, a, what a glass of water is, I would have to measure every molecule of water, and then what I'll do, and I'll see what every molecule is doing, well, you won't get to fluid dynamics. So um, we have to do the same thing. We have to step back and say, what are the fundamental principles underlying all this? and not get focused on the complexity. We want, to, we want to look for fundamental principles. And I believe there are them, and maybe you disagree, but I believe they're there. And we have to, that's what we need to focus on to get rid of that complexity. I, I, I'm, it's, it's great to see people clapping and getting involved in that collective intelligence way. I was, I, I was noticing Sydney here up, and I, you, something kind of came, escaped your mouth in last night's panel that it seemed like you also had a skepticism, and it's interesting to hear this coming from you, that just you know, mapping out the detailed wiring at every level was really the right way to go. Is well, that? I think oh, we have a microphone. Hmm. I think we are possessed by this business that 
we could get a total description of everything, an atom by atom description of the world, and that's all we need to do. But I don't think we will do that. We need, I don't think that that approach will work. In fact, what I think it'll do is it'll make it even more opaque. It'll produce so many numbers, if you like, that to be able to see through this. So I have a principle, which I think by I mean, to think about evolution, how did all of this get that way? And I think that the key thing is, uh, is to look at uh, what the biological system does. And I think it treats everything like income tax. It is criminal to evade, but they're legal means of avoiding it. <laughs> so I think it deals with complexity that way. And if you look and say, oh, we have to solve, you know, 2,000 partial differential equations can't be done. It's no use saying we'll wait for bigger computers. The thing is to find a way of doing it that doesn't involve that. And biology has found many tricks in the game that I think avoid this. And I think that's what we've got to look at, look for in the brain. I mean, very simple things is simply to look at... Uh, at the question of whether we are not program-driven machines, but table-driven machines. And I think there is a big difference between that. Uh, you can see it in, in thinking about computing. There are two ways of answering the question, what is factorial 5? One way is to invoke a program labeled factorial and apply it. The other way is to say, look up the table labeled factorial and tell me what's the fifth entry. Okay, the way we used to do logarithmic tables. If you ask, how did we get those log tables? By any means whatsoever. <laughs> Hand calculation, abacus, whatever works. But once you've got the table, that's it. You don't have to do it again. Yeah. So I think that, that is, that's the problem. That is what the genome. The genome is a table lookup things that tells you you don't have to compute all the conditional things. Just look it up. It's been done before. The guys that have failed are no longer here. Tough <laughs> luck on them. That's it. So I think we must look for these ways of bypassing. So whenever I hear the word, oh, it's too complicated. We're going to have to do a lot of mathematics to do this. And I just want to tell a final story. This, uh, <laughs> Jack Cowan, who was a physicist who went into neuroscience, once showed me an equation, a big integral differential equation, and he said, that's the way your brain works. Mm -hmm. And I said, Jack, I know for certain it's not the way my brain works. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the way yours works. <laughs> but I know for certain my brain doesn't work that way. So I think we should take this and look for the shortcuts. Yeah. Yeah, you may get it wrong a number of times, but I think the cumulative thing that we have in our brains is, I think, what we need to look at our generalization capacity, making it simple giving us a table we can look at. I, I, there's another last example, <laughs> which is, how do you catch a ball? I mean, it's completely <laughs> impossible that a man runs to catch the ball, that he's calculated the complete trajectory, and that he'll calculate which way to go by this to, to coincide with the ball. He says, the ball's going to the left, I run to the left. So it does it by approximation. I think there's a lot of that in the way we work. Sorry to no, take no so much Great. time, and uh, thank you. Thank you. So, I mean, I think everyone agrees that uh, we need to understand the fundamental principles of the brain and then base models 
on those fundamental principles. And I think it's just a question, the, the question that's coming out is, how much information should we have in hand in order to establish those fundamental principles? Since we're telling stories, I'll tell a story. That from 25 years ago, Terry Sanofsky and I were invited to a, a meeting by, that was organized by ONR. And they thought, there's these people working on visual recognition, and attention, and so on. And they really, we need better theories, models of how this all works. So we'll put them together with some people who have designed computer networks that do switching and communication and so on, and theoreticians and mathematicians. We'll put them in the same place. We went up, we're in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and we can't communicate with the outside world. And if we just communicate with each other for a few days, some of those principles might emerge. And in talking with them, the, 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 the people said, would ask basic questions like, OK, so the information comes into the visual system. What's the first level of representation? Well, we don't know that. He says, well, um, you, get, you talk about all this feedback coming back. Where does it go? Well, we're not quite sure. He says, how much of the information coming back is feedback? Well, we're not quite sure of that. And what does it do when it comes back? Does it turn the cells on or off? Well, we're not quite sure of that either. And after they, they just, question after question, they kept coming back to, we don't know, we don't know. And they said, you know what? Let's have a meeting when you guys know a few things. <laughs> and I sort of feel like, you know, and, and that's what the field's been doing over the 25 years. It's been accumulating a few of the basic facts about how the systems works. And it's just a question of, of how far have we gone and how far do we need to go in order for some of these important principles to come out. Obviously, some have already. But uh, some of us think that not all of them have emerged. communications and information theorists who are good at uh, error correcting codes. But in any case, yeah, uh, Toby Berger was there. And actually, uh, one of his students is now in my lab working on a project. So it's, it took that long, but we're finally getting there. Uh, and I have a, a simple question. I think it should have a simple answer. Um, so 42. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so What's that's the, the number question? of billions of dollars it's going to take to solve the problem. <laughs> and the question is, who's going to pay for it? So DARPA paid for early AI, NIH paid for the genome. Who's going to pay for intelligence? Good question. Google. <laughs> 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 I am an artist, so everything I do is with emotions, and that's a word that I haven't heard from all these people that are trying to build the next man-machine interface and cognitive processes and how we should learn and how we should interact. And it takes a lot of emotions. Um, second, you know, the whole way that machines work for the past 40 years have completely changed. Um, I, I was a pioneer in computer graphics, and they only had three colors, red, green, and blue for a long time, and I will take people to change the typefaces and they'll tell me four letter words. Um, and then um, I did the first study on children and how they learn and how they interact. And it's a lot of what's ha happening here, but you know, they, they love to laugh and they love to um, just play around with things. And I find that, you know, they, model themselves after what they, the stories they live. And to me, that is a very interesting point that's been discussed now. So given all this, how should we collect data now from now on? What type of systems should we build? What type of things should we take away from the systems? And what should really be included in general in all the systems? Because now we have half a man and half a woman at MIT as students. So. Anyone want to weigh in on emotions? <laughs> well, I, I'll take a, a little bit of stab at emotions. First of all, I, I would speak for most uh, neuroscientists that uh, emotions are also a property of neurons and the interactions between them. So uh, most people would believe that emotions are not something special and different, that it's outside of the, of the realm of neuroscience. Um, and so then it, when you accept that, if you do, then emotions become one of 25 things that are waiting to be understood. You know, there's a lifetime in vision, there's a lifetime in sensory motor integration, there's a lifetime of studies and all these things. And so um, I think uh, the, the, the bias might be, and I'll speak for myself, 
that emotions is one of those things that, but maybe not the only thing or the most essential things. And we can, we can, you can view emotions in some ways as, very simplistic ways, you can say emotions are the sort of switches that tell us when we should learn and when we should not learn and things like that. Um, so th there's no answer to it. You didn't really ask a, a very concrete question, so there's no really a concrete answer to it. How do you build the next system for what type of generalities should be in the Well, that's, that's sort of the, that's a that's the topic for tonight. Oh, that's creativity. Yeah, okay. Anyway, I think, I think at least one, one partial answer to your question is that things like creativity and emotions are part of the framework of what brains and neurons do, and it's one of the many things we need to understand. Um, and I can tell you don't like that answer, but that's okay. The, the, yeah, I mean, the, I would echo that. The premise of this whole meeting of minds and brains and machines and so on is, is a computational paradigm, right? We, we can understand the mind and the brain as computational systems. And I, it's, many people will say, well, how does emotion fit into that? But one of the many things that's you know, it's quite interesting that we're coming to understand, again, you saw this at the brain level in Rebecca Sachs' talk, but things like moral judgment or emotions, we, we don't have to view them as kind of opposed or complementary to computation, that they're actually computational at their heart. I mean, think about, for example, like it's, you know, th when we think about emotions, we maybe think about things like happiness or anger and what's the computation there. But think about, for example, the emotion of regret. So this is a great example that a number of people have written about, that you know, to feel regret, like do, you know, does a rat feel regret? I don't know, Matt might say in, in its sleep the rat regrets that it didn't get to the end of the track or the food or something. But you know, it's, it, a regret is a, is a cognitive and a computational emotion. To feel regret, you have to do kind of counterfactual reasoning and be able to imagine the way the world could have been otherwise. A famous example is you know, if, you're, if you're late to the airport and you miss your plane by 30 minutes, um, well, you know, compare that situation with, say, being late because you um, got stuck in traffic, you're there, you, miss, you, you, you come 30 minutes after the flight left, but the flight was delayed, say, because of a mechanical failure, and only left two minutes before you got there. You feel more regret in the second case because it's easier to imagine the counterfactual situation in which you could have been there. That ability to imagine alternative realities and what you could have done differently, you know, that's the very same kind of computation that we're talking about when we're talking about, you know, like, what, like the, the kind of causal analysis behind vision and just imagine the different possible worlds and what, what, what to do in your situation or Matt's planning and navigation. Yeah. Let me tell you a story. That's a brief story. I went to the Neuroscience Society meeting several years ago as I was helping and working with Tommy forming the, the McGovern Institute. And I sat in a session you know, focused on schizophrenia. I, the best intellects in the field spoke. I sat there for four hours, well, three hours for all the symposium. I walked out. I didn't hear a thing I thought I could depend on in moving forward and doing an experiment. As a field, I didn't learn a thing. And so I showed you an example in which it's limited. <laughs> it may not take us anywhere, but we have 12 loci I am absolutely confident, are related to having an increased risk of this disease in which you hallucinate and hear voices from some other world. Now, it may not tell us anything about the brain, but being a simple biochemist, I can build on that. <laughs> right? I can build on it. <laughs> so, no, wait, so it's a moral is that you're saying neuroscience can't do it, or it's too early for neuroscience? I'm to, saying to do pay attention. Pay attention to what this field will tell you in terms of human variation in how the brain works. It may take us another decade. These neuroscience, autism, schizophrenia, manic depression, may be so limited in their their guidance to the system, how the system functions as a system, that it may not tell us a lot. But by looking at human variation through genomics, it's going to be an organizing principle to attack this problem from a chemical point of view. And that will lead you incrementally through lots of pain and effort and work to understanding how the system works. And you know, it may take us a decade, and Sidney's sitting there, he lived through this, and understanding how biological systems transmit information, it was a long-term effort, but it came out of genetics and then how a system integrates those genetic variations in physiology and phenotype. Maybe a, a, to put that into a question to some of the other speakers, like what do you think about the relation between trying to understand the way the, brain's, the brain can break 
and also just other kinds of variation. I mean, many of us talk about how does the brain work as if there's just one way that it works. <laughs> so studying both normal variation and you know, variation in, in disease and disorders, what is the relation between that enterprise, which is a very exciting and important one, and a lot of MIT research is going in that direction, and this other enterprise of you know, the fundamental question of how does the brain give rise to the mind and how can we build AI? Are those two different enterprises or how do they inform each other? I mean, they're clearly linked, right? We need to understand the brain both when it's normal in order to see how it differs from a pathological brain, right? So it's clearly, they're closely linked. We need to understand the normal brain in addition to understanding right, so, so what one argument pathology. Is you can't understand, I mean, one people, or one, one argument you hear from people is we can't understand the pathologies until we understand the normal brain. How could you understand what, what it means, you know, t look, at, look at a condition like autism, which is an incredibly important so, uh, social and medical problem. <laughs> And a devastating condition, uh, but we don't we don't really understand you know what it even is at, at at the behavioral level or at the neural level. And some people might say, well, how could you understand that until you understand? It's not an either or. Right? You want to understand both, and I mean it's happening of course at the same time at the same institution. It's not that yep. we have to put everything to stop. First we understand the normal healthy brain, and then we understand the disease brain. It has to happen both, and it is happening both. Well, even something like autism, it's, it's a, it can be looked at as a distribution. Do you, it's not a question necessarily of you have it or you don't. Spectral disorder. But it's almost like a, a, a might be even normal curve distribution of not just a, a, a ser serious pr um, medical problem, but any kind of behavior, including something like ADHD, a distribution of some kind, neurologically speaking. So there's also a couple of clues that have come out of the genomic studies. Uh, first, it, it's, it looks like it's a developmental problem that occurs very early in the brain development and then maybe manifests autism, many years later. And secondly, a lot of the top genes that are coming out are ones that are expressed in synapses. And uh, there are literally you know, hundreds and hundreds of proteins and very intricate uh, biochemical reactions taking place there. There's many ways you can screw it up. You know, I should say, Terry, we're probably actually going to get into a more detailed discussion of that tomorrow morning in our Nature Nurture session. Um, both given the topic, the panelists. So this is an advertisement for our okay, session, good, right? Good, good, good. So let, why don't we say, since we're running so, short on time, why don't we say more on that tomorrow morning? So uh, I, think, uh, yeah, I think, you know, it's time to try again. It's also time to go to the reception. <laughs> <laughs>